who's the president of the College of Online, Darren Mockery, who's from the Association of Ambulance Chief Executives. We have Professor Julian Redhead um, from the, Nation the National Clinical Director for Urgent and Emergency Care at NHS England. And we have Rachel Harrison, who is the National Secretary of the Public Services Sector of the GMB. Welcome. I want to um, start with asking a question reported by the British Heart Foundation that there are now 230 uh, deaths which are being uh, associated with the um, every week which are being associated with um, the crisis we are seeing in emergency medicine at the moment. What has gone wrong and why are we in this situation? If I can start with you, Julian Redhead. No, thank you very much. I think um, it's important to understand how the whole system is working together at the moment. Uh, I think the first point is around demand, and demand on our emergency services is, is up to phenomenal degrees, especially at the moment. Um, we've seen increases in flu, we've seen increases in COVID admissions, and the cold snap. We know cold weather is associated with ill health as well, and we've seen rises from those as well. And that's, that's not just now, but sustained over a period of time as well. I think the other side is the constraints that we have around flow and therefore occupancy within our hospitals. And our occupancy levels are higher now than at most times of the year. Um, so we're running at about 98% occupancy across our trusts. Now the reason that we're running of those at the moment would appear to be mainly due to discharge in that we are struggling at the moment to be able to discharge patients into alternative uh, uh, care positions and we know that we've got a large number of patients who'd, who would call the criteria to reside which is a sort of a way that we can identify patients who may be better cared for in different environments and so we know that we've got a large number of those patients in our beds as well. So what we're trying to do is to, is to understand all of those flow systems to make sure that we can respond to our most vulnerable and sickest patients. And the trouble with when we've got occupancy in the hospital very high is that the and the, the A&E services themselves become overcrowded as patients wait in the ED to come into beds and that causes difficulty with being able to bring uh, ambulance patients out off the ambulances and into the A&E departments which increases the number of ambulances outside of an A&E department. Uh, that then has a consequence on ability to answer calls um, uh, because we know that the call handlers <coughs> then get multiple calls against the same instance as people are ringing back to say, when can I expect my ambulance? And our response times are in difficulty there as well. So all these things are all interrelated across the whole pathway. And what we're trying to do at all times is to try and find solutions and ways that we can make the system uh, more productive, i.e. we can get patients through our systems as, uh, as easily as possible, and working with our partners, both in social care, um, and community care and mental health care to try and move as many patients as at the correct time to meet their needs uh, that they have during their care period as well. So I think those are the sort of important sort of background information uh, that we need to have. Undoubtedly that means that our response times are difficult for the ambulance service at the moment and I know that they're doing everything they can to try and improve those response times both internally but again working with partners across uh, especially with the integrated care services uh, to make sure that we bring everyone together to try and find those solutions that we need to do. And that includes increasing bed numbers, which is what we've been trying to do uh, across the NHS as well, um, with ambition to put 7,000 more beds in for this winter. And the, we're on track to achieve those both in real beds and also virtual beds. It's important that we look at new technology as well. Um, and those plans are, are there, but it's not just a question of new beds, because if we can't discharge, we're going to fill those beds. So we have to do that with process change at the same time. Um, so uh, we're working really hard to try and improve those ambulance turnaround times so that we can keep the ambulance on the road, bring patients who are most vulnerable from the community into where they need treatment, which will be into our hospitals, and that includes heart and cardiac patients. We've also worked hard to try and protect those services such as cardiac and stroke services, we know that those patients have time critical interventions which will help them in the long run. And the ambulance service themselves have done a lot of work on this in making sure that we've got the right codes and the right patients in the right category so that we can respond to those who are most sick um, as quickly as possible. And I'm really grateful for the support that our colleagues have done uh, around that work as well. Um, so 
And we know that the, the, the call handlers themselves want to help those patients that they know need those time critical instances. So that's what we're trying to do is to help them as well to make sure those ambulance response times improve. But it is demand and flow which is our problem at the moment. Thank you very much for your answer. John Martin, I'd like to ask you a, a question in the light that we are seeing an increase in demand um, on the service. In my own ambulance trust, a 16% increase since 2019 in uh, demand on the service. So um, how is the service actually keeping up with the supply of workforce to be able to address that demand? Because clearly one thing we do know is that the waiting times are increasing uh, in, in order to, to, for patients to receive vital care. Good morning, yes, it's, it's really difficult at the moment um, in, in terms of those waiting times. They've got longer and we can see that in the national data. Um, that is partly about demand, as we've outlined, you've, you've mentioned 16%. I look back over the last five years nationally in, in England, it's gone up by 18%. But I think really importantly, it's gone up much more significantly in the higher acute category. So what we call category one uh, is, is way, way higher than it was previously above 50% increase over the last five year period. So we, we're seeing a sicker population who are calling us more often. Um, paramedic members of the college up and down the country are working extremely hard uh, to meet the need of patients, uh, but we're seeing less patients in a shift than we did previously. And that all comes back to the flow and demand that Julian has already outlined. So if we went back a number of years ago, we'd see more patients, we're seeing less patients, that, that causes a problem and actually for our members, uh, paramedics like myself working up and down the country, um, that's having a big impact on us and our morale, our ability to care for patients um, and our ability to, to do what we need to do to, to keep patients safe. Thank you. Um, if I can um, go on to ask Darren Mockery, is there now a call for a further reconfiguration of services to be able to address this crisis? Because it doesn't seem to be abating any time soon. It's something that's been building for a substantial time as we've just Hurt. So is there a need to look again at how the flows work within the system to ensure greater patient safety, but also to ensure that people are seen in a more timely way, which we know is clearly life critical? Yeah, well, good, good morning, everybody. I'll not repeat what John and Julian have already said, but just to pick up on a couple of things. So in terms of reconfiguration or looking at the current models that we have just now across England, um, I've been working very closely as a chair of the Association of Ambulance Chief Executives with Julian and the National NHS England team. Um, and looking at a, a revised or a new urgent and emergency care strategy. And if you think about what Julian said earlier on around hear and treat and see and treat. So hear and treat is when we treat more patients over the phone and signpost them to more appropriate care, or we indeed send a paramedic out to those patients and then manage to manage those patients in the community without needing a, an emergency department attendance. That's very much part of what we want to continue to do, because if you look at the figures year on year, we've been really, really successful in doing that. And what we want to do is we want to work with our partners across the whole system, as Julian says, and continue as much of that as we can as long as it's safe uh, and effective for those for those in, individuals. So that would be very much part of the urgent emergency care strategy going forward. Um, the other thing that the Association of Ambulance Chief Executives has been working with NHS England on more recently is looking at, in the new world post-COVID, how do we right-size our ambulance services now in England to make sure that they are capable of doing what we need them to do? Because we can see that you know, when I think back to 31 years ago when I joined the, joined the ambulance sector or the ambulance service, we can see that we now spend a lot more time on scene, which is the right thing to do, because that's us trying to make sure those patients are managed more locally and in the community, but equally hospital handover delays because of the flow issue that Julian described have gone up, you know, probably six or seven fold since it was when I worked on, on, on the road. And that is obviously eating into our availability to then be able to respond to patients in the community. So the piece of work that I'm working with NHS England on now, um, and the things you point you're asking is can we now look at what model do we need going forward and how do we right size ambulance trust for the future to meet the needs of um, a post COVID world? Can I just ask you when we can expect to see that new strategy as clearly the crisis is now and are there international examples of really good practice which we need to aspire to? Yeah, so, so NHS England would probably be best place, or Julian would be best place to perhaps talk about when that strategy uh, will be finalised and, and launched, um, because um, you know that's an NHS England strategy. In terms of um, best practice internationally, believe it or not, we still 
have a lot of best practice internationally. I sit on the Australasia, so Australia and New Zealand um, meetings. I sit on the federal meetings out in the USA, and I sit in the Paramedic of Canada chiefs meetings as well. And a lot of those countries still look at the UK for best practice, particularly around the hear and treat and see and treat. I think the big challenge we've now got in the UK um, that other international countries have as well, to be fair, is the flow the hospital handover delays and that vicious cycle of then not being able to respond to those patients in the community. You just need to go on and look in the newspapers you know, over the weekend and you will see it in Australasia, you'll see it in certain parts of the US, you'll see it in Canada. They've all got this challenge around flow. As John said, patients much sicker than they were before um, and it's that perfect storm, I think, post-COVID that we're experiencing now. Thank you. Julian, if I may, quickly, when are we going to see the strategy? So the, the, the strategy we've been writing, and it's, it, it, the important thing about the strategy is that we've been engaging with people from all over uh, the different parts of the service, right down to the sort of uh, <coughs> consultants and the nurses at the shop front, to make sure that they understand and get a chance to, to, to talk about the strategy, and that's true for the ambulance service as well, um, to make sure that we've got the right strategy going forward. I think that's also going to be linked towards the recovery plan for the UEC, which um, we're hoping to get out in January to make sure that everyone understands how we can recover that. But Darren's absolutely correct when he talks about international comparisons because the, the, the strategy is also we've looked internationally to say what is best practice internationally. And actually I've been talking to a number of partners in different countries as well because I think we do need to, to look around at all the different potential innovations and changes that we need to make over the next five to ten years because strategy needs to look at that sort of time frame but the recovery plan will be much of a shorter how do we implement that and how do we go through those. So I think there's a lot that we are learning from our international partners. It is an international phenomenon. I'm an A&E consultant, so I talk to my colleagues in other countries as well, and they are all struggling uh, with this overcrowding in EDs especially, um, uh, but that flow issue that I talked about already. Okay, a date. When, when are we going to see it? I, I, I haven't got a date, but I, obviously we can try and get one back. It's being, it's being written up at the moment, so we're working together to get that written up. Okay, early next year, do we think? Oh, yes, no, definitely. Right, okay, thank you. And, and if I may, Rachel Harrison, what's the impact on your members, on the, the staff in the front line, uh, and, and taking the calls of these delays? Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's absolutely having a devastating impact on our members. Um, frustration, stress, burnout, exhaustion, low morale, mental health. Um, our members are, are, are tired of going to work every day and in some cases spending the whole of their shift sat on an ambulance outside an A&E department with the same patient. We've had examples where our members have clocked off at the end of one shift to return the following day to the same patient being on that ambulance with the crew they'd left them the night before. Now our members went into this profession to become healthcare professionals to help the public and provide patient safety. They feel they are being physically prevented from being able to carry out their jobs today and that is because of this knock-on impact with handover delays and waiting times and the fact that patients can't be safely discharged into hospitals and when they eventually get to a job that they can see on the monitor somebody has been waiting hours and hours for this call, they don't know what situation they're walking into, they don't know if that individual will still be alive, they have friends and families that are screaming at them as if it is their fault and these are the very individuals that are not to blame for this situation. So our members have taken the steps that they've taken to vote for action and this is one of the central parts as to why they are doing this because we have been raising these issues for years and we have been ignored. As early as last year we wrote to this committee and we had a very supportive response but we wrote with a copy of a letter we sent to the government highlighting we've come out of the pandemic, we're heading into the worst winter pressures that our members are reporting to us and it fell on deaf ears, nothing was done and those issues are even worse now. Mm -hmm. So our members are exhausted, there's the highest sickness levels amongst all category of workers in the NHS in the ambulance service and that is because of the terrible conditions they are being expected to work in. And this isn't just the frontline paramedics, technicians, emergency care assistants, this is the call centre 
people that are having to deal with this influx of calls and screaming family and friends that are frustrated and the massive increase in mental health calls that they're having to deal with because there are no or they've been significantly reduced access to community and mental health services so the whole impact <coughs> across the workforce is massive <coughs> and our members are pleading on the government to do something about this now. Thank you ever so much and I think the NHS workforce survey has demonstrated on every single category that ambulance staff have the lowest morale and also the, the greatest pressures being placed on them. Lucy, yes. Um, thank you very much Rachel and I just wanted to follow up on what you've been saying because as local MPs we will work closely with chief executives of the ambulance, our local ambulance service. I'm a West Midlands MP. I have heard since the start of this year exactly what you have been saying. Mm. I've been passing that on to government via ministers. Um, West Midlands Ambulance Service experienced 44,000 lost hours in one month um, waiting outside hospitals and what has really frustrated me is that like you say no one has been listening. You've explained how you've tried to get the voices of your members heard. I just wonder um, Professor Redhead are you hearing that message? Do you understand what Rachel's saying? Do you understand what I'm saying about what's happening on the front line? No, no, I, I absolutely do. I mean, I, I, in my own a &E department, when I talk to paramedics who come, I can see exactly those effects on them as well. And obviously, I mean, I talk to the medical directors of each of the ambulance service, so absolutely, I understand that. And it's <coughs> of how we make sure that we get the, the right... Um, the, the, the right investments and the right areas to improve in the right time frames and so that's Anthony what we're trying Marsh, to do. The, the Chief Executive of West Midlands Ambulance Service said at, at the start of the year that by August September West Midlands Ambulance Service would start to fail and I just wondered what then happened when you get a message like that what what action is taken that would prevent us from being where we are now with with members quite understandably saying no one's listening we have to take strike action we also work very closely with Anthony um, uh, because of his role uh, nationally as well. And uh, the action has been taken. What we've tried to try to is increase the number of call handlers because mm. some of the problem originally was around call handling and being able to make sure that we can answer the telephone call. Um, so we've increased the number of call handlers by over 300 from they were a, a year ago. And that's also for, for 111 because there's, an, there's a, a link here between 111 and 999 calls. So we've also got to increase the number of call handlers so patients can get the advice they need through 111. And that's, those have been increased um, as well by sort of 5% as well. So trying to keep up with that level of demand around the call handling as well. Um, we've also um, uh, uh, put in more uh, focus in terms of those handover delays because that's really what is, what is uh, having the issues for both the ambulance crews themselves because that's they don't want to be outside the ambulance, they want to be able to help people. And so we've been working with individual trusts, they've got real issues with this. Is this um, trust specific? Because if I look at data for the whole of the West Midlands, I can see that Telford and Rekin, which is where I'm from, uh, has the worst uh, waiting times. Is it because the hospitals in that region are less good at discharging patients than other hospitals, or is it something more complex? It's always going to be more multifactorial, but there are hospitals who are more challenged than other hospitals, and those are the ones that we've really targeted to try and get those improvements. But we've also put in um, work with all trusts across the country to try and improve that handover situation. We launched a winter collaborative um, where we're working with each trust around eight different factors that we believe would help to try and improve that services as much as we can. Although, again, I'll go back to discharge being the number one that we need to do. And obviously we've got the Discharge Task Force, uh, which is led by uh, Sarah Jane Marsh, and also the, uh, a new board set up within NHSE led by Leslie Watts to really look at this work around the, uh, the discharges. And the Discharge Task Force has had some success working uh, with parts of the discharge process they've got the most control over, and we've seen improvements in the numbers of patients from that clinically reason to reside where we can see some improvements in those. And we've now got a specific challenge out with community trusts and also with local authorities to try and help that position. And obviously the government have released more money into, into the local authorities to try and help with those discharges as well. So there is work that is ongoing all the time to try and improve those situations. Um, John Martin, can I ask you, what would you like to see happen um, 
around these delayed discharges and the other factors that are preventing uh, ambulance paramedics from doing their work. Yeah, so talking to our members, hospital handovers is right at the top of the list of, of their issues. If we look at the situation report uh, most recently published by NHS England on the 11th of December, there was 4,232 hours lost in one day outside hospital, and that equates to 176 ambulances. Uh, that is our members who are really struggling um, because they, as Rachel says, can spend the whole of their shift outside, our, outside of a hospital waiting to hand over a patient. That has a huge impact on um, paramedics who are in the back of the ambulance, has obviously a huge impact on the family and, um, and the patient themselves. Uh, we, uh, we pride ourselves, going back to international comparisons, on, on having great paramedic education in this country. We are, we are considered um, at world leading in our, on our degrees, how we create paramedics. It's really frustrating then. You can't use those skills on, on patients across the course of your shift because you're with one patient waiting outside of a hospital. Um, also true, really, that our training is about emergency care, about urgent care, about providing for that in the community. That's quite different to the education of looking after someone for hours at a time outside of a hospital. So it's having a huge impact um, on morale, having a huge impact on patients. And you can see everybody is frustrated, including um, the ED doctors uh, that, 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 they, that we then hand over to. Is this the real underlying driver of tomorrow's strike? Uh, so we're a professional body, not a trade union, but I think in terms of what our members are telling us, uh, the, the frustration is that they, they are worn out, they're tired, um, and they want to get back to being good paramedics. And sorry, um, Darren, I wonder if I could just ask you, uh, what else would you like to see happen to improve this situation that we've just heard so, so eloquently described? I think in the, in, in the short term, we, we have to find <coughs> a way to unblock the flow. Um, and we need to find a way to get ambulance patients handing over their patients. And that is easier said than done. And as you allude to, some areas can do it better than others. And the work that I'm doing with the uh, Association of Ambulance Chief Executives, Julian and others, is how do we share that best practice across all parts of the country to see if we can reduce some of that unwanted variation. So there's a big push to do, to do that. But even the trusts actually, or even the ambulance uh, regions that had relatively good handover delays over the last few years, and I include North West Ambulance Service, where I'm also the chief executive, that's starting to get worse and worse and worse now as well because of this flow issue. So for me, it's about how can we get ambulance crews freed up quickly so we can respond to the next patient. Um, that's the short term. There's a big piece of work or a lot of work going on just now around frailty, falls and mental health because those are a huge volume of work now within the ambulance sector so again working with NHS England and colleagues around how can we perhaps ask mental health trusts and community trusts to do more to support some of those lower acuity patients that are phoning nine and nine because they don't feel there's an alternative because that would take some of the pressure off the ambulance sector to allow us to get to those heart attacks and strokes and the patients that we talked about at the beginning of, of the meeting um, and in the longer term or medium to longer term we absolutely have to now right size the ambient sector for the future and continue to look at that innovation and international best practice for it. and their staff and their patients deserve it you know and i hear what rachel was saying there about how, how staff are feeling and i hear that every single day i go out and do either a clinical shift as a paramedic or when i go out or uh, to do station visits um, and it's you know, it's soul destroyed it really is for our staff just now in the short term do you foresee that this is going to continue to deteriorate this situation <clears throat> Uh, yes, I, I, I cannot see how in the next few weeks and months ahead that the situation will improve. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, James. Sure. Um, can I just ask about targets, response time targets? Um, I mean, they were introduced <coughs> three or four years ago. Um, I don't think they've been met consistently since they were actually introduced. Um, do we, would it be useful to not have targets? Or are targets actually been a factor of complication? Um, yeah, targets have a, a, an, an interesting effect on paramedics. So uh, they've, they've changed a number of times in the 20 years I've been a paramedic. Um, we pride ourselves on providing good care, and you need to have a way of monitoring that. Uh, at the beginning of the session, we mentioned the British Heart Foundation report. For some conditions, time plays a huge factor, and therefore monitoring time is absolutely important. Is it the only thing that we should monitor and get hung up on? And I think the answer to that is, is no, and, and paramedics would tell you uh, that uh, time is important, but it's not the only factor. What, what, so else, it's about what, else, what else should we be 
putting into those? Because it's at the moment it's purely to do with response time, are we hitting it or not? And that has an effect on public perception too. So. What, yeah, what? so um, NHS England and Julian might want to comment, do have a, another set of indicators, the clinical quality indicators. So if we take something like a, a heart attack, so where you, well, you're phoning up with chest pain, uh, we look at the response time. We also look at uh, once the paramedic arrives, do they give analgesia, so pain relief? Uh, do we uh, take the patient to the right location? Because often for patients who are having a heart attack, it's not to the local district general hospital, it's somewhere else. So there, there are other bundles that are used. They're often not reported on, though, um, uh, but time still remains a factor in that. So I think it, it, it's both. I think you have to have both. Mr. Rev, do, do, we need, do we need targets? Or would it be better if we got rid of them? It's important, I think, to remember where the targets came from, because they came from a, a process, and, and, and colleagues will know more about this necessarily than I do, so I'll do my best, but correct me if I'm wrong, uh, where it was a clinically-led um, position where they reviewed lots and lots of different ambulance calls in 2015, I think it was, um, through a long process to look at what the target time should be for different types of categories. So the category one response time um, of, uh, of eight minutes is important because that's how fast we need to get to for patients who may have a cardiac arrest to increase survival times. And that's also true when we look at some of the category two response calls as well. So there are, there are, there are conditions which do rely on that time. Um, and it's important that the public have confidence um, as best that we can to give them that confidence that they will get the responses that they would expect. If the, the, if the targets have been consistently not met over a long period of time and we may have the argument that actually they're calibrated wrongly, doesn't that actually undermine public confidence unnecessarily in that it sets an expectation that the system is just simply not going to meet? And, and I understand your point, um, but I think it's also important that we continue to strive to improve our services all the time. And where there are time critical interventions required, then I think we do need to make sure that we're meeting those. Um, so I think that the, the time standards, I think, are right. It's always nice to look at some outcome measures as well, but that's very difficult sometimes when the public want to know exactly what they could expect, and that can be complicated sometimes um, if we go into more complicated types of, of monitoring for those. Rachel, what, do, what, did, what does your members think about targets? Unfortunately, because of the staffing crisis and the um, demand on resources, targets are just a number now because they know they can't meet them. Regardless of how much effort they put into their working day, they know they're being prevented from meeting the targets. And I think the reason for that is, you know, demand for ambulances has risen ten times faster than the level of resources. So it's just becoming impossible to possibly meet all the demand that the public are wanting from their ambulance service. We've, we've seen call volumes go up by 80% since 2010. And when you've got 133,000 vacancies across the entire NHS, there just aren't the individuals there to be able to respond to all those calls that are coming in. Um, category, it was mentioned earlier about the, the increase in Cat 1 calls. Well, cat, Category 2 calls have gone up as well. Um, they've gone from 25 minutes to an average of 48 minutes in two years, and that is actually leading to more deaths during patient transport. We're going to be writing to the Secretary of State about some information we've got on that, but these delays are impacting on patient deaths, and we have to tackle the root cause of this, which is the workforce issue, which ultimately comes down to their pay and their working conditions. Yeah, Derek, I just wanted to come and talk about this. Uh, a number of you have spoken about the, the change in nature of demand, and I just want to ask, ask Darren, um, is it possible that we are categorising too much into category one and category two when we actually are triaging calls. So even though demand's going up, the composition of that demand is being skewed because of decisions at the triage point. Yeah, a, a just hypothesis, what, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, just before I answer that point, I just wanted to come back on the last question you asked around the targets. And I think it's probably fair to say that if you look at just after um, the ambulance response programme, which is the new targets that Julian referred to, that I think started to be looked at around about 2015, just prior to COVID, actually, many ambulance trusts were 
achieving those standards. And in fact, I know in the Northwest, there were a couple of weeks throughout the middle of COVID when demand came down and we had extra resources on, <coughs> that we actually had met all our targets for, if it wasn't a day, it was a couple of days. But that's unfortunately not been able to be sustained for all the reasons that we've just spoken about just now. And as Julian says, there was a lot of work done trying to look at having <coughs> clinically appropriate targets in terms of response times and also the ambulance quality indicators, which looks at more of the clinical outcomes. But in terms of triage, um, there are two um, primary triage systems used in the in the UK. One is NHS Pathways and one is MPDS, which is a, an American product. And I think about half and half of the ambulance services in the UK yeah, use, use those two products. And we've been looking at how do we continue to refine those products to try and make sure that with our non-clinical call handlers who do an amazing job under relentless pressure, as we've heard from, from Rachel. But Darren, Darren we... sorry, can I just, just on that, do you think the pressure might be leading to to the easy categorization of calls into one and two is that no, is that a consequence of the pressure no i wouldn't say i wouldn't say that because the call handlers are, are trained to follow the algorithm and to go through the scripts so they, they, they wouldn't deviate from that unless we were you know unless they were you know they were told to by a clinician in the room but even at that they're likely to go through the whole script because they're audited on that so i don't think i don't think anybody's trying to you know i know you're not saying this but nobody's doing a shortcut to, no, no. to try and you know, triage calls differently what uh, what i think we are seeing and somebody said it earlier on one of the witnesses is we are seeing much uh, more sicker patients as well we're seeing a lot more sicker patients in that category one and two basket, which is driving up those, those, those numbers, if I'm being honest. We've also introduced, in addition to our highly trained um, call handlers, we've introduced many more clinicians into control rooms as well over the last few years. So that could be mental health nurses, it could be midwives, it could be paramedics, it could be general nurses, with a view to supporting our, clinic, our, our call handlers to triage those patients the best we can. So we're putting a lot of emphasis and support into the into the call centres, but it's just not enough with the volume of calls that we're receiving just now. And it's the knock-on effect of the duplicate calls that's causing the problem. Because if we can't get the vehicles freed up at hospital to respond to patients in the community, we may be taking you know, several thousand additional duplicate calls, which is blocking the whole thing up. Just, just as a final, so I think there was a couple of references to the fact that you're getting an increase, there's an increased number of calls related to mental health uh, of, of a variety of sorts. Um, how do you think they should be handled? I mean, how does it work at the moment? If somebody, if somebody presents through the call system with, say, um, an acute mental health issue in crisis, does that get triaged out somewhere else, or is it handled directly by, by the ambulance service? <coughs> or they are, are they in a kind of grey area? Sorry, is that still a question for me? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, Darren. Yeah, just yeah. A, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, so, the, so we will triage mental health, frailty, falls, um, all the same as we would with any other call that would come in through the 99 system. Our call handlers would take them through the particular card on the on, on the on the call handling triage system, um, and they would then come out with certain dispositions at the end of that. So it might be that there's an immediate threat to life. It comes out as a cat one call, and we would immediately dispatch an ambulance. Mm -hmm. It might come out at a more lower acuity call, in which case we might ask one of our clinicians in the clinical hub within the control centre to look at that call, take a mental health patient as an example, and they may phone the patient back. Increasingly, however, what we're seeing. <coughs> A lot of the calls coming into the ambulance service for frailty falls and mental health could be um, dealt with more appropriately by other parts of the system. So what we're working really hard with on just now with NHS England and our other um, acute um, and mental health and community colleague partners is how can we perhaps signpost those patients much quicker to mental health crisis lines, to mental health community teams, to falls teams, to community services, because if we if we can't do that, then it overwhelms the 999 ambulance service and then we can't respond to those higher acuity patients. So there's a lot of work that Julian perhaps could talk about in a minute that's going on just now to see what more we can do to set up and establish much more robust. And when I mean robust, what I mean by that is available, you know, 24 seven um, responsive. So when we need them, they can respond, et cetera, et cetera. So that takes a bit of the pressure off the 999 system. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I mean, there has been a suggestion of a specific emergency uh, number for mental health, so that may be one of the solutions in there. Caroline, I'll bring you in now. Thank you. Um, 
I wanted to ask uh, John a question. Oh, bef- bef- uh, before I do, I have to mention that I have been out in ambulances before as part of my paediatric work, mostly on neonatal um, and occasionally on paediatric transfers um, as a clinician back in the ambulance. Um, so, um, you talked about, uh, John, about 176 ambulances being lost to time waiting outside A&E. What sort of time frame is that over and what sort of proportion of the overall ambulance stock in that particular shift would that be? Uh, yeah, so I took the, the latest situation report um, published by NHS England on the 11th of December. So that was 4,232 hours um, over a 24-hour period. So I've just divided by 24 to get to 176 yeah. ambulances. So uh, arguably, so that's across the country. I think Lucy pointed out earlier that it, it ranges um, uh, around the country. Uh, I think we need to ask Darren about the, the total number of ambulances on. Uh, but I think what we do know is that 176 ambulances uh, will see circa 2,000 patients between them because we know uh, that, that you'll see five to six in a 12-hour shift. So uh, you can do you can do the the, the multiplication there. Um, uh, and I think it is it is the frustration of our members about being stuck that actually you want to be back out and helping, and that is exacerbated by. Um, with the demand that's coming in, we, we rightly in ambulance services then do what's called a general broadcast. So as a paramedic, you can hear that there's patients waiting. That has a, a real impact, and we might call it moral injury, if you look at some of the literature, on people who are, who are now wanting to be able to leave, leave one patient and start with another one, and they're hearing those calls waiting and being held. Uh, that's having a huge impact. An even bigger impact on those who are working in our um, emergency operations centres, because they are seeing the stack of patients waiting, and uh, we've just talked about clinical triage and how difficult that can be in those situations. Okay, I guess the question is, if these, um, I, I understand the frustration of, of waiting, uh, that must be an awful experience. Um, is 167 in this context uh, sufficient to resolve the problem? In other words, if we resolve the flow problem, would 176 ambulances that you're losing um, cover the calls that you needed to provide a really good service? Is the ambulance service well resourced? But but the flow problem causing, or is it a joint problem? That's, I guess, the question I'm getting at. I don't think it's the single solution to the problem. Um, yeah. uh, 176, um, if you went with basic maths of 2,000, multiplied it out across the month, you'd probably get to about 60,000. The increase we've seen uh, in the last five years is about 100,000 extra incidences in a month. So it will still be short. Um, and I think the other important thing about flow and response times is absolutely that you need to have some spare capacity. That's what we need with beds. It's what you need with ED departments. And that's because variation <coughs> happens during the day. When we go, uh, when we go shopping, um, if four of us turn up at the shop at the same time as only one cashier takes us longer if there's if we go in one by one it will be shorter response times and I think that so that variation has to be played in so it is certainly part of the solution if we can free up that um, it takes three years to train a paramedic fire a degree route so uh, we've got a good recruitment pipeline lots of people want to be paramedics in the country we don't have a problem um, <coughs> recruiting people into the profession but it takes a while to uh, recruit them and uh, we have seen an increase in the numbers of paramedics um, over the last uh, 20 years certainly, certainly last decade um, so there are more paramedics than there's ever been uh, working across the the whole of the NHS and outside of the NHS actually so I think that the, the, there's a very positive story about what paramedics have become uh, but I, I think the, the handover delays is, is one part of the solution. Thank you that's, that's really interesting. Um, part of this strike planning has been what do we do and how do we replace capacity because I don't think anyone wants to see people lying on the, on the pavement suffering and cold because there's no ambulance there because the ambulance people are on strike. Um, and one of the suggestions I've been reading about was that some of these ambulances will be replaced with taxis. Um, I wonder what your thoughts on that are, and particularly if some ambulances, you know, you're in an ambulance, you get your two members of staff, your paramedic or your technical staff, you've got a whole box of really quite clever kit in the back there. Um, if you can replace that with a taxi for a strike, does that mean that some of the people who are currently using the, the kind of the whole the, the whole the whole bells and whistles the whole um, kit don't actually need that and could we replace that kit with taxis at other times enabling paramedics to be freed up to see the patients that really really need the, the whole works so I think it's it, it, you can't replace a paramedic with a taxi and I think what we we need to get into so paramedics 
uh, registered professionals, uh, as you say, uh, Carolyn, have got a whole range of uh, drugs, equipment, yeah. uh, monitoring that we can do with patients, as well as that, that clinical assessment yeah. and getting to a, a point. I think the, the, what will happen uh, in terms of putting a patient in a taxi, uh, presuming that they don't need a critical intervention there and yeah. then, uh, they'll be conveyed to hospital where actually it might be a paramedic in the hospital who sees them, who does the same, uh, the same scope of practice as we would do pre-hospitally. What will, that will have is a huge impact on, on hospitals. Uh, we know uh, over the last five years that our conveyance rates um, have uh, dropped. We're, we're essentially taking about the same number of people to hospital as we were previously from the ambulance service, uh, paramedics working in the ambulance service, uh, whereas uh, demand overall has gone up and that's because our see and treat rates are how often we uh, don't convey people to hospital because we've done an assessment. Obviously someone in taxi is not going to be able to do that assessment, they are going to get taken to hospital, that will put more demand uh, on uh, overwhelmed emergency departments. Uh, so I, I don't think it is, it is replaceable, the question is, is what's the model? Do we want paramedics out there seeing a whole range of patients, um, which we do do, from uh, life-threatening to uh, more urgent care type conditions and we are able and we are trained and educated to assess those in the in the community and that's what we're doing and that is keeping ambulance conveyance rates um, uh, not going up exponentially in the way we have seen uh, 999 calls have. So, do you, so just to clarify you think that at the moment all of those people that are going in ambulance to hospital need need the whole ambulance to go to hospital they don't it's not simply a physical moving one person from, to, from one place to another because they couldn't otherwise get there. So those that are taken to hospital, uh, where a paramedic is assessed, and I believe do need to be taken to uh, a hospital in, in our current setting, and that's because they'll either need further tests, further examination, uh, of, often uh, needing a stay, stay in hospital. Uh, is there more that we can do in terms of our education of paramedics? That has been happening in recent years and will continue to happen to continue to bring the, the conveyance rates down. Um, is a plan to use taxis unsafe? I think safety is a, uh, I've been asked this a lot of times in recent days, we like to frame it as a binary concept of safe and unsafe, and you'll know because you work in clinical medicine that um, it's, it's not either safe or unsafe. Do I think taxis are far less safe than using a paramedic in an ambulance? Absolutely so, and I, so, so for some patients it might be okay, for, but for a group of patients they're not going to get assessed, they're not going to get analgesia. Um, so pain relief, uh, they're not going to get an assessment and they might be then conveyed unnecessarily to hospital, whereas we would have been able to look after them in the community. Thank you. Um, Threadhead, I wanted to ask you about the, the flow issue. How <coughs> when people get to ambulance, they're, they're queued up and sometimes I look out my office window and I'm doing a clinic and I can see um, work at Peter Hospital and I can actually see the queue outside the window um, of people waiting. Um, that's very frustrating for staff. And actually, quite you know, cost and labour intensive. You have a patient who may have slipped and fallen in the street, may need treatment, may have banged their head, have some gash that they need to set sewing back up again. Um, who's got two members of staff and a whole box of tricks in the ambulance, take, taking up all that time. Sometimes, as um, Rachel says, for, for many hours. Um, is there an, is there an, are there any alternatives? I mean, we've talked about social care and the, the issues of the, the, the overall flow, but but are there any other alternatives to to that being used as, for example, saying to one ambulance crew um, to come into the hospital building and then hand over to another, so you've got two crews looking after one patient, so that, you know, because one-to-one -one is routine for ITU and most of these patients are not that sick. So are there other ways of using these paramedic experts um, better, perhaps just inside the hospital but not handed over to the hospital teams, to get more of these 176 ambulances back on the road? The answer is yes, and that, that's something that the ambulance service do in conjunction with the hospitals. Because, um, but the difficulty is when you've got a very overcrowded A and E department, and space becomes absolutely critical as to physical where space. the physical space to be able to place patients in, in a safe environment. And again, it's this risk balance between the different safety factors of being in the back of an ambulance, being in a corridor, being in overcrowded A and E, being on a, on a ward, or putting more patients on wards. So there's always this this factor of, of balancing those risks across the yes. system that we need to do, and the ambulance service help us with that um, as they come. So we do our, we would always try and release crews, um, and I know every hospital wants to release the crews, it's not something they want to do, um, and certainly um, the, the, the staff within the hospital don't want that position either. No. Um, and I think some of this also is to do with how we can get alternatives to the A&E 
um, so that ambulance crews can go to other, other calls. So we've heard about the full service and um, care for patients who may need to, uh, who have no injuries as a result of that fall and use of the urgent community response teams, which we're encouraging. There's also the, the work that we're doing around ESTEC, which is same day emergency care where patients can go directly when we understand what their treatment needs are, they're less likely to be admitted by going through that sort of process as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of different factors that we try and take into place uh, to try and avoid those situations. And we've heard about some of them in mental health as well and some of the, the work and investment that the ambulance service are quite correctly doing around mental health. One of the things you haven't mentioned there is pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And uh, both watching my mother's admission to hospital uh, earlier in the, in the year and watching her wait 12 hours for her drugs to come up. And as a, as a clinician myself, seeing how long it takes sometimes for drugs to come up for patients, to what extent does delays in pharmacy TTOs, as we'd call them, um, to contribute to this flow problem through A&E and therefore to the ambulance backlog? I think it's going to vary between different hospitals. I think most hospitals now would have situations where you don't necessarily need to wait. The patient can go home and the drugs can follow um, in, in terms of being able to deliver the drugs to patients. Yep. And obviously encouraging, as you know, our junior doctors and ourselves to make sure that we've got the TTAs written up in a timely manner to make sure we get those discharges. And a real focus for most hospitals at the moment is around discharging patients before <coughs> 12 o'clock, especially those patients we know can go home the same day. Um, and exactly for that reason, that what we want to do is to release the beds to be able to bring patients through and make sure that we're not getting those under unnecessary delays around TTAs. And that's something that each hospital is absolutely focused on. Thank you. Also, I don't know, Lincolnshire has this thing called Lives Volunteers, absolutely fabulous service of people who go out in sort of paramedic-like cars, essentially, providing um, first, first aid and first care to patients. I don't know whether that's widespread across the country or how much that um, can help support the ambulance service. Yeah, I'm happy to comment. First, Darren might want to comment. So, uh, yeah, community first responders are used up and down under the country. That's because for cardiac arrests, uh, it's really important that somebody gets there quickly who can do CPR and can use a defibrillator, and that doesn't need to be a paramedic. You need to be followed up by a paramedic once you've uh, had that initial response, uh, and that is what's happening. So, uh, I, every ambulance service in the United Kingdom uses a scheme similar to lives, um, and uh, they are very much there for critical patients where time, uh, minutes, and seconds actually make a, a huge difference. And what that immediate intervention isn't isn't a paramedic that immediate intervention is someone who is trained uh, in that immediate uh, life support thank you i think we're going to move on first, unless there's anything urgent i had a question i was going to ask rachel about okay if i could um about the about the pay we're going to come on to the industrial oh, situation okay. next so if you can hold that hold thought that would be um wonderful but i am going to come on to um rachel harrison Next, as we move on to look at the industrial situation, tomorrow 10,000 workers are going to walk out on, on, on the strike. The, the unions have said that they want to um, talk, to negotiate over pay, and this afternoon the unions will be meeting with the Secretary of State um, over the industrial dispute. What are you wanting to see as the outcome to that meeting? Well, unfortunately, we don't <coughs> expect an offer to be made on pay today. We've been given half an hour to meet with the Secretary of State to discuss um, emergency cover for tomorrow, um, which, considering our strike starts at midnight, is a bit late in the day. Um, but those agreements have already been reached at a local level. So unless the Secretary of State is willing to talk to us about pay today, those strikes are set to go ahead. Now, what we've been calling on him to do is to come to the table, talk to the unions, make us an offer on pay that we can take back to our members, and they will be the ones that determine whether that is a good offer or a bad offer. But that is the quickest way to resolve this dispute. Now, we've been calling on the government and the pay review bodies to recognise NHS workers for, for many years now. And for the last two years, We've entered into that process in good faith under an extremely delayed timeline, which actually meant that the lowest paid in the NHS this year had to have a top up given to their wages to prevent the employers from breaching national minimum wage rates. Now, due to the timeline that has been given to the PRB again this year, we will be in the same position 
So the national living wage has now gone above the minimum of these people working in the NHS. Now these could be your call handlers, these could be your patient transport um, workers, they're your porters possibly, they're your cleaners, your caterers. These are people that carry out crucial jobs within our NHS and because of um, a dated and not fit for purpose pay review body process that significantly delays getting money into people's pockets and the approach of this government towards public <coughs> service cuts and austerity means that we have got members working right across the NHS on low pay and this is the exact reason we're seeing them leave. So our plea to the Secretary of State is talk to the unions about pay, make us an offer. GMB is refusing to engage with the pay review body this year because we believe the government has hid behind that recommendation that was made back in the spring of this year. And, and we believe that what we actually need to see is true reform of the PRB process, where the remit given doesn't tie the PRB's hands into existing budgets that have already been set and the existing um, bank accounts that the trusts are already struggling to manage and that there's independence on that panel and that they are free to make recommendations that considers things like the true cost of living um, and the impacts on the workforce. So that's why we're calling for reform. We're asking the Secretary of State to come to the table. In the past, the government have moved away from the pay review body process. We had pay negotiations in 2016 and we had pay negotiations in 2018 that the employers and the Department of Health were representative at. And Jeremy Hunt himself um, in 2014 chose to ignore the recommendation of the PRB. <coughs> so they can step away from that recommendation. So what we're calling on the government to do is talk to us, make us an offer that we can take back to our members because our members don't want to strike. They've been forced into this, so we're in it, the government have it within their control to resolve this issue, and they could do that today. Thank you ever so much. Julian, I just want to ask you, because we constantly hear government ministers saying that the pay review body has um, set the, the, um, the, the process, stressing its independence. However, government appoint the members, um, <coughs> set the remit, define um, the terms of affordability and control when and how the recommendations are published. So within this situation where we clearly have got a, a disparity in, in, in expectation between government and the, the workers here, the independent pay review body doesn't seem to have the ability to make the recommendations of what needs to be done to be able to resolve this dispute. So how do you see a mechanism and a way forward to be able to address that issue if the pay review body doesn't have that power? I mean, obviously, those, those are really questions for government rather than for, for myself as, as NHSE. Um, obviously, they're, they, they're the ones who define those, sort of, those parameters of pay. So I think those questions would need to be to, to the government. I mean, I think what we're concentrating on, and I think all of us, including the Jimmy, are concentrating on is to try and ensure that we keep our patients as safe as possible doing any industrial action. Um, and obviously we respect the right for people to take the industrial action, but we all are there to make sure that we want the public to have confidence and to be safe during those periods. And I'm sure that's something that we all want to do. And, and if I may, um, to both John and, and Darren, um, we've heard that um, the impact of low pay um, on, on the workforce and this pay dispute currently is having a massive impact on recruitment and retention. Do you concur with that? And as a result of that, what else needs to be done to address the, the issues of recruitment and retention? Yeah, so Goods Primary is a professional body uh, rather than a trade union, so I'm not going to talk specifically about terms and conditions. Uh, as I said earlier, we don't have a problem attracting people into the profession. Um, paramedic is a, uh, has a good number of people coming in. Uh, retaining them in the profession is, is much harder. Uh, I think that's partly uh, for those who are in ambulance services. Our members tell us that uh, this, this impact that we've talked about uh, over, over the last few minutes is, is having on them, uh, but also because paramedics um, <coughs> as a profession have got lots of opportunities now. So 
we've got them working in primary care, um, uh, we've got them working in emergency departments. I think that's good for individuals, it's good for longevity of career. Uh, difficult to be a frontline paramedic uh, into, your, into your 60s, uh, whereas uh, maybe working in other settings is possible. So it, we've got primarily a, a retention problem and some of the salaries outside of the ambulance service are, are higher and more attractive. And Darren, do you agree that uh, retention is a, a major issue and um, is pay a, a factor in that? Yeah, so, so that's one of my biggest concerns and I know it's a concern from all the chief executives as well is the fact that it's not just about pay as we've already heard, it's about the working conditions that the ambulance staff are working in. And as John says, you know, we don't have a problem re um, recruiting and, and, and training paramedics up across the country necessarily, but the challenge we have in the ambulance sector is paramedics now no longer want to continue to work in the ambulance sector. They want to go and work in primary care and, and other you know, primary care and, um, I don't know, emergency departments and, and other disciplines as opposed to working in the ambulance sector. And it's down to the hospital handover delay issue, I think, is one of the single causes of, of that. So it's not just about pay, I would argue. Um, and I know we've, I think everybody said that, to be fair. Thank you very much. Lucy. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I could start with you, Rachel, about the impact on patients tomorrow in, in, in terms of patient safety, but also longer term impact uh, on the backlog that's already there. Um, how do you think that the, the, the action tomorrow will impact patients? Well, first of all, give GMB's assurance that our GMB reps and local teams have been working around the clock for the last couple of weeks with local employers to agree derogations and exemptions and to make sure that essential cover is in place. And we have entered into all of those conversations in good faith. Um, I believe most agreements have now been signed off um, and you know we're, we're doing our role in communicating to our members what, what they are and encouraging them to adhere to the exemptions that, that have been put in place. It does vary the cover by um, service and the reason being is the unions feel that the correct <coughs> people placed to make the decisions as to what care is needed in local communities is the people working in those communities and that's why we may see variances of what those arrangements look like. But you know, life and limb cover will be provided. The last thing that our members want to do is put patients in harm way. But the reason we've ended up in a position of, of dispute now is because they feel they're prevented from being delivering patient care. And we have to realise that right now, today, people are not getting the ambulances. They are taking themselves to hospitals in a taxi because they can't get the ambulance. You know, people are dying, waiting to be handed over at A&E departments. That's happening today. And that is one of the very reasons that has driven us to this dispute. So we will do everything within our power to ensure that communities are safe during this action. The government has to play their part. They have to come to the table and talk to us. Our members want a resolution to this. Uh, Professor Redhead, what um, steps have been taken to reassure the public that all CAT 1 and CAT 2 will definitely be responded to tomorrow? No, no, thank you. And um, obviously, um, we're very grateful to the, the members or, uh, and the member staff who will come to work and use those derogations to do that. And I think that that is important to recognise that that as part of their strike action. Um, I think the, uh, what we've done is to concentrate with our unions to make sure that we have the services available for those sickest and most vulnerable patients to have the response that they required. And those in general will be, will be in Category 1 and Category 2 uh, uh, call-out categories. Uh, there are others where there may be elderly patients who are on the, on the floor for some time as well um, who also may need care. So that's why we're working very hard with the unions to, to get those derogations. Obviously, we've also tried to support those services um, with bringing in, um, obviously, there's the, the military in some instances. Um, there are other clinicians who are, are going to help to try and make sure that we <coughs> keep those, maintain those safeties. And the unions are aware of those and are working with us to make sure that they're integrated into the care of our patients. So I think the overarching message is that emergency care will continue. We've heard about the life and limb emergencies, and that shouldn't discourage us from dialing 999 if we feel that they, that we, that the, that the public feel that they need that service. They will be answered, and an appropriate response will be available when that's required. Will patient safety be affected tomorrow? 
I, I think that the, we're doing everything we can to maintain patient safety, um, and that's what we're concentrating all the time. And none of us, I don't think any member staff, I know a lot of paramedics would also say this, nobody wants to see public safety um, uh, be harmed by this. John, can I ask you about that, about the public's safety tomorrow and, and, and what your perception of it will be? Yeah, so I think, um, as I said earlier, I don't think safety is black and white. It's not no. one or the other. Um, right now, today, uh, we're seeing long delays for patients. There's lots of patients uh, waiting at the moment to, to, for an ambulance uh, response. Uh, on Wednesday, even with the derogations, that's likely to be, likely to be worse. Um, but with this um, life and limb cover, uh, paramedics up and down the country will absolutely want to uh, keep patients safe. I, I think the important bit to note in that, though, is um, uh, the Category 1 calls, the ones <coughs> that come in at the time, uh, that look like they are life and limb, they, they will get a response, and, and we're working, um, uh, the unions are working very hard on how that will occur. It's the group who are in Category 2 and below who maybe don't start off a life and limb, and this is what we're seeing today, let alone Wednesday, who will deteriorate over time, um, and eventually they will become a, a life or limb emergency. And obviously at that point, then they do fall into the gap, but it's whether or not that, uh, that but that, that's happening today. So it's going to be really clear, that's happening today. Um, and that's what we see for the Category 2 response times that Rachel mentioned earlier, it was 48 minutes was reported in, um, in November's figures nationally. That's that's twice as long as it was a number of years ago. And it's those patients who are waiting and some of those who are deteriorating. Uh, we're seeing that they then, they then get upgraded. So you call back and you say, oh, this has happened to me. And, and that probably explains some of the shift in, in the, the category one numbers when we say incidents are up. So I think we need to be clear that those who are in a life and limit, it's the ones um, I think our members are worrying about that, that are gonna deteriorate over time and, and whether something can happen with those. But that's happening today. Uh, right now, um, uh, before we even get to industrial action on Wednesday. Thank you. And Darren, can I just ask you a final question about addressing the issue of morale and burnout amongst paramedics? How do you feel, what do you feel should be done to try and assist? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's really, really difficult just now, isn't it? I think if I think about the, the 31 years I've been in the ambulance sector and the 34 years in the NHS, I would say this is the most difficult time I've experienced. And I know that a number of my chief exec colleagues have experienced as well. And I know that's how the staff feel because I speak to them day in, uh, day out. Um, it has absolutely, I think, been exacerbated um, on the back of COVID. There has been no um, respite whatsoever. Um, you know, normally we would get respite in between the peaks of the, the winter periods and a little bit of respite before we went into busy you know, summers and then back into winter. But if you think about COVID, we've just had no respite whatsoever. And I think that's what's really seriously affecting our morale of our, of our staff. And that's why I'm really um, you know, desperate to continue to work with NHS England and Minister around right-sizing ambulance trusts so that we can have the right <coughs> level of resources to, res to respond to the new levels of demand with the new pressures that we see across the ambulance sector, continuing to do all the good things that we have been doing with regards to hear and treat and see and treat. And I would like to see us build in to some of those rotas and patterns some more protected time to look after our staff from a continuous professional development point of view and from a health and uh, wellbeing point of view as well, um, because that, that's what we need to be doing and, and that's what I'll continue to work with NHSE colleagues and ministers on going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. And, uh, the NHS staff survey said that 80%, 80.2% of an, um, ambulance staff are experiencing burnout, so a really important issue. James, if I can turn to you. Just, um, just to Rachel, I can't just listening to what you said about the, the sort of driver for the dispute, I can't work out whether it's about pay. Um, I think you said it's about your members being prevented from doing their job. W which is it? The legal dispute is, is fundamentally about pay. Um, ambulance workers' pay has been um, slashed in real terms. Um, I think the average is 13%. It's been slashed. I mentioned earlier about those in the call centres and patient transport services that have fallen below the, the living wage. So this is absolutely about pay at the heart of this, and it will be an offer on pay that can resolve this dispute. But the reason our members have chosen this year to vote for industrial action is a build-up of everything that we've discussed today, because it's not just GMB members that have said enough is enough. All you have to do is look at the 14 health unions that are recognised across the NHS and how many of those 
have balloted their members this year because they've been asked to ballot their members by their members and how many of those have secured mandates for industrial action that tells you the strength of feeling across the entire NHS and ambulance service workforce. So patient strength safety standards are at the heart of this. A, but strength of feeling about what? We've got, a, we've got a health system which is being funded by £180 billion by 2025. It's never had so much more money. Everybody recognises that COVID presented huge challenges to the health system, which were outside the control of the government. Um, so the government has committed a huge amount of additional resources to the NHS at a time of severe challenge in terms of recovering from the backlog. Isn't this completely inappropriate time for unions to be uh, considering industrial action? No, this is the, the ideal time because this is our members saying enough is enough now. They will continue to leave the service in their thousands if we don't start to do something to address their working it's conditions to your and their pay demand, home pay. Which is agreeing to your pay demands, is that right? So it's, it's, it's about pay. So if the government this afternoon... If we want to keep members in the <coughs> service. If, if the Secretary of State was to agree to all your demands this afternoon and we were to all walk away from this, then... Um, the, all of the issues that we've been discussing today would be resolved? No, absolutely not. The, the service is still in crisis. That is no overnight solution. But one issue that will be resolved is that our members will feel rewarded and they will feel valued, not only for the last two years during the pandemic efforts, when they went to work and many of them didn't go home mm -hmm. because they had insufficient PPA, that this government wasted money on contracts, they were sent to the front line without protections. So rightly so, they have had enough. So yes, pay is the crucial thing, and that is the legal dispute, because we've got hospitals setting up food banks. How can our pandemic heroes be having to access food banks, not being able to put fuel in their cars what's just your, to attend what, what, what is the bottom so line the dispute is about pay. What, was your, what, what do you want? So what GMB asked for, along with the majority of the other unions at the time that we put our PRB submission in, was an inflation-busting increase, a commitment... What does busting mean? whatever inflation was at the time, above that, um, an immediate um, plan to restore a decade of lost earnings with a down payment. So what we're actually asking for now is an immediate solution on pay. Make us an offer. We will take that offer back to our members and they will be the ones that determine whether it's a sufficient offer or not. So we're not making a demand. We're saying make us an offer. Okay, thank you. Caroline. Thank you. Um, Rachel, what you said about the frustration and what others have said about the frustration of paramedics wanting to do the job but being stuck outside A&E in ambulance waiting is a, is, is, is very powerful um, emotive response. But, but, but like uh, James, I am somewhat confused because you said earlier it's not about pay, it's about the response. The, the, and then you've said, but if he gives me an offer on pay today, then we could call off the strike. Um, and obviously, calling, giving, if the government's only got so much money and it chooses, say, it's, say it's, it's said that £700 million pays 1% on agenda for change bans, if it, has set, if it found £700 million, would you want it to give that to your union um, members in pay? Or would you want it to invest in perhaps additional space in A&E so that they can more effectively do their job by getting back on the road quicker? As we've said, there's no overnight solution to the crisis in our health service and social care. Absolutely not. And it needs a lot of investment and a credible plan. At the centre of that, though, is the workforce. And what we are seeing, and it's been said today, is that we cannot keep staff. Not only have, has their pay been eroded in real terms, <coughs> their working conditions have been severely eroded. Earning capacity on things like unsocial hours has been taken away from 2018. So people are leaving because they can go to primary care or to GP services where the pressures are a lot less demanding, there are no unsocial hours, and they don't have to spend their entire shift in the back of ambulances. We've got students. Sorry to interrupt you, but you didn't really answer the question oh, as sorry. I understand it. So if the government's got £700 million pounds and it, has, it wants to choose to spend it on investments in capacity in A&E or flows in social care or things that will make the working lives of your um, uh, members less frustrating so they're slightly to get stuck outside A&E or spend it on what, an extra 
which should the government choose? Which do your members want more, a less frustrating job or more money? They, they want to be able to do their job. Yes. So, 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 you, so you, you absolutely would, you would say government should invest it not in the pay, but in, in stuff that makes the job easier to do. They, they need investment in their pay if we are to keep them. There's no point having extra beds and extra services if there are no staff to, to run those services. That's the ambulance service and it's the NHS. We need investment in the workforce now and at the centre of that is pay because if we continue to lose the existing staff, all the recruitment drives that are being happening at the moment are pointless. If we cannot hold on to our existing staff, there will be no NHS and there will be no ambulance services. So we have to invest right now in the workforce and sit and have a proper conversation about how we tackle the crisis. And that's got to involve social care as well because we cannot get people out of hospitals if the care isn't out there in the community. Okay, so it's pay. So do you support nurses' requests for 19.6%? Do you think, is that the sort of pay rise that you're looking at? GMB didn't ask for 19%. I'm, I'm conscious that at the time RCM put their submission into the pay review body, they asked for RPI plus 5%. As I said earlier, we've not asked for 19%, we've asked for inflation busting. And what we're asking for right now is a conversation on pay and to make us an offer. Okay, so you're not happy with the, the independently verified offer, independent review offer, but you want a, a better offer. I understand that. Um, but... There's, there's some kind of discussion, and you see it in the media, they talk about nurses' pay, ambulance drivers' pay, paramedics' pay. But actually, all this pay is one, one scheme, isn't it? So you have the Agenda for Change bans, and if you're not a doctor or a dentist or an extremely senior manager in the NHS, you're all paid in uh, one of nine bands. There's some division of band eight, but essentially one of nine bands. So a newly qualified nurse and newly qualified paramedic are both paid band five. So there is actually no capacity to pay paramedics and nurses differently unless you change the bands that they're in. So if you're not asking for as much as the nurses do you, and you support the nurses' request, do you think that paramedics, ambulance um, technicians and call handlers are in the wrong agenda for change bands at the moment? Do you think their work is equi more equivalent to uh, a higher work in a higher band or do you think their, their banding's right but the pay for each banding is wrong? I think there's a huge issue with pay banding across the whole of the NHS in all of the professions. Mm -hmm. um, there's a large piece of work being undertaken at the moment um, with the ambulance service profiles and also the nurses and the midwife profiles, but that will not solve the issue. The real issue is that people are being expected to work, regardless of their job, expected to work under extremely different circumstances than when their job was initially um, evaluated. And what we're also seeing is that those people that have stuck with the NHS are having to pick up the workload of the 133,000 people that aren't there. So all of the workers in the NHS are working under extreme pressures and we would be calling on all employers to review all of the jobs because we definitely recognise that people are not being paid the correct rate for the job in all, in all professions. So the, the agenda for changing bans have been in since they negotiated the last Labour government in 2004 and, and the unions themselves. And the unions wanted them at the time because they felt they could then make sure that equivalent jobs were paid in an equivalent manner. <coughs> Are you suggesting that your members would now need, want to see dismantling of agenda for change, so that paramedics and ambulance staff are paid in, in a different set of negotiations to nurses, to managers, to porters, to cleaners and everyone else? Or do you want the no, members to stay we're, the we're not suggesting walking away from agenda for change. What we're, what we're saying has happened is that the jobs have changed drastically since they were initially evaluated. So it, it needs a whole refresh and a whole evaluation. So we're not suggesting walk away. We're still supportive at this time of the agenda for change and that encompassing all the professions within that. Okay. It's, it's more a case of you think the band, bandings of the jobs are not quite right anymore. People aren't being paid the correct uh, rate. Healthcare assistant is a good example. We have a lot of healthcare assistants that are paid at a band two, whereas more and more medical tr um, treatments have, have slipped into their job roles, which means they should be getting paid a band three. And in many places, we're struggling to get them uplifted to the band three to truly reflect the job that they are now being required to perform. Okay, fair enough. The other thing is you talked about a decade of lost earnings, and I was confused by that. And I got some figures looking at bands 3, 5 and 6 between 2005, which is essentially just after the agenda for change came in, uh, and 2021. 
And in all cases, band three, band five, and band six, the proportion of median earnings that is earned by each of those people is higher now than it was in 2005. So when we ask taxpayers to pay the salaries of the mi over a million people on Agenda for Change pay, and the government say 1% on Agenda for Change pay band is £700 million, that £700 million has to come from the wider population in taxes. And when we do that, we take that from people whose earnings have risen in line with you know, mostly private, private sector in, um, wage increases. Um, and we look at the median, the middle number of salaries of a whole time equivalent median gross earnings. And actually, for band three, band five, and band six, which are the ones that we, we looked at, so your, your call handler, your newly qualified paramedic, and your fully trained has been there a while paramedic, um, the proportion of median average earnings that they earn now is higher than it was uh, a decade or more ago. So where's the decade of lost earnings if, you're, if your, wa your members' wages are reasonably increasing in line with the wages of the general populace? Well, the way faster than the general populace. I've obviously not seen your, your, your statistics that you're referring to there, but, but on the calculations that we've mm -hmm. done, it's the real term earnings, it, as in they've not kept up with inflation. So every single pay review body recommendation we've had since uh, 2010, I think it is, has been below the level of inflation. So in real terms, our members' pay is not keeping up. In the ambulance service, on average, it's 13%. It's, it's but also, what's not generally included in, in, in statistics like the ones you're quoting at me is acknowledgement of the fact that for our ambulance service members, a lot of their um, take-home pay is built around their own social hours, which again was cut in 2018. Um, and a lot of them rely on, on overtime. And to be fair, the ambulance services cannot function without the goodwill of our members that do overtime. So it's difficult to comment on, on, on statistics like that because they don't necessarily take account of the full picture of what our members are earning. But, but our members are seeing real-term losses um, because of inflation and cost of living. And they are taxpayers themselves, so any increase, they will be paying more tax back to the system as well. <coughs> so what happens if, um, you know, if the government say, look, even 1%, 700 million, we can't set, select out paramedics, we can't select out nurses, it's a gender for change pay bans, they have to be, the whole NHS has to be paid that amount of money across the board, it's unaffordable, um, are you going to continue to strike? Are, are, are patients going to have to suffer? Well, what, 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 what would you do if they say, no, I'm sorry, we just, we just don't have the money to afford this? Our members will be the ones that decide, they're the ones that have voted for action, they are the ones that have determined what action we will take and when we will take it we will continue to say to the government our door is open to talk about pay our members will be the ones that decide on any pay offer that is made and if no pay offer is forthcoming we will continue to have that conversation next year as we head towards the next round of, of pay discussions as Thank well you. and perhaps if i could just ask darren and, and john as, um, as, as, as paramedics themselves um if the government's got £700 million to invest, does it invest 1% in your pay, in your pay and, and, and your colleagues' pay, or does it invest £700 million in A&E capacity, social care capacity, and other things that make the job a more um, rewarding and, and, and fulfilling experience? Darren first. I, I think um, in terms of the 1% uplift or whatever it may or may not be, uh, that is really a matter for the peer review body and, and government, isn't it? You know, I could give a, an opinion here around what I think it should or shouldn't be. You know, we know what's happened in Scotland, don't we? Because I used to work there for many, many years, so I've got a lot of contacts up there. Uh, I think it's very difficult. I think, um, you know, from the Association of Ambulance Chief Executive's point of view, I keep coming back to the work that we're doing with NHS England just now on right-sizing our organisations. So if there is some money available to go into the ambulance sector to do just that, I think that will help all of our ambulance sector colleagues and you know, all of our staff. Um, but pay is a, a really a matter for government and peer review body. Thank you, Darren. John? So our members would definitely say uh, working life would be better if there were less hospital handover delays, if when they went to refer a patient in the community that the service was available, uh, etc. Et so uh, that, that would make a huge difference. But I'm not sure this is an either or choice, because at the same time, uh, not retaining paramedics in the ambulance sector as well as in, in other parts of the NHS that paramedics are working, if pay is important to them, as I've pointed out, we're a professional body, not a trade union, if pay yeah. is important to retention, to lose our experienced paramedics, either to not be a paramedic any longer or, or to other parts, 
uh, is hugely damaging. So then you might well have better referral pathways, um, less handover delays, but you won't have a workforce left. So uh, uh, as it is a matter for government to decide what, what, what are the choices and which ones we're making. Yeah. But our, our members would definitely be saying that they, uh, they want a, a, better, a better ability to deliver care as paramedics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I just uh, say thank you ever so much for coming along today, John Martin, Darren Mockery, uh, Professor Julian Redhead and Rachel Harrison. Um, it's been a really enlightening session. We hope the talks this afternoon are constructive and we look forward to seeing the national strategy when it is published and, and we hope that's soon. Order, order. Thank you. Thank you.